baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Amen, amen. While you remain standing, it's a great day to serve God. Isn't it? A great day to serve God. Our hearts have been, been blessed tonight with such beautiful singing by this choir and the other singers. The testimonies, the words from Brother Yance, from Brother Dehart. Brother Elms, Brother Cornwell, these tremendous men of God. It's so uh, great to be here and be with them and be with all the wonderful missionaries and your wives and all of the uh, saints of this local church. Praise God. The presence of the Lord is in this place tonight. I don't know what God wants to do before this service is over, but I do want him to have his way, don't you? I want his will to be done. I want God to talk to us. I want God to speak to us. We are not here just to kill time. We're not here just to, just to go through the motions. We have been hearing, even in these day services, some things that has been uh, stirring and challenging, and I believe things that will change our lives and make us better men and women for God. Thank God for these uh, Bible studies and lessons that we've been hearing today and yesterday and more in store tomorrow. Praise God. I tell you, when this is over, I'm, I'm ready to go back home and start winning souls, aren't you? Praise God. I'm ready to go back and teach some Bible studies. Hallelujah. In fact, I, I'm teaching too Saturday. I'm, <laughs> so you're not going to get me out of conviction real bad right now. Just <laughs> I got two every Saturday and got another one starting. And God is great. Hallelujah. It's a great day to be alive, Brother D. Hart. Praise God. It's a day for revival. Everybody say revival. Turn and shake hands with somebody and say, when I get home, I'm going to have a revival. Will you? Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And we don't have to wait till we get home. We can have it right now. In our hearts tonight, let's clap our hands for the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Oh, praise God, praise God. Praise God. God wants to do it. God will do it. He is doing it. And going to continue to pour out His Spirit until He comes. Praise God. Let's open our Bibles tonight. Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter 4. And we read tonight a very familiar verse of Scripture. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 13. Thank you again, brother and sister Young, and all of this beautiful church family for hosting this Christmas for Christ seminar, 1982. What a lovely atmosphere there is in this church. Thank God for the wonderful spirit of leadership that your pastor and his wife exemplifies in this place. 
Praise God. It's just good to be here. Praise God. It's, it's a joy to be here. And, and uh, what, a, what a joy it is. One of the brethren told me last night from this church, he said, we hope the seminar keeps coming here all the time. He said, if you decide to change it somewhere else, we want you to let us know because we'll probably try to go there and be in on it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And uh, what, a, what a wonderful place. To be in what a good atmosphere there is in this congregation. Amen. I feel God in this place. Praise God. Praise God. What a lovely church building. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's great that there are beautiful buildings like this where we can come together to worship God in. Some of our buildings are not this nice. But thank God for this lovely structure that we can come to praise the Lord in. Thinking about years ago, I heard a story about a, an old gentleman many years ago. He and his wife lived way out in the country, and uh, they had never seen a mirror. And uh, the story went that uh, one day he found the mirror. They was up in an attic somewhere uh, looking around, and they found an old mirror. And uh, he looked in it, and he said, well, I'll say. He said, uh, I always wondered what my old dad looked like. said, that's a picture of him, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, so he took it and hid it. His wife saw him and thought he was acting a little strange. Took it and hid it under the mattress, and she thought, I'll go see if I can see what he's got. And uh, so she waited till he got out in the fields, and she went and looked under that mattress. And she found that mirror and looked in it, Brother Dehart. She said, that's just what I thought. That's the old hag he's been running around with. <laughs> We're in a modern church tonight. <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I, heard the, <laughs> I heard a story about a farmer. Before I read my text, <laughs> said uh, his farmer had been taken in so many times by the local car dealer in his dealings with the car dealer, and the dealer had always added so many things on to the price of the car when he went in to buy. Finally, the dealer came to him one day to try to buy a cow. And so he priced it like this. He said, uh, to you, basic cow, $200. Two-tone extra, $45. <clears throat> extra stomach, $75. Product storage department, $60. Dispensing device, four spigots, $10 each. <laughs> $40. Genuine cow hired upholstery, $125. Dual horns, $15. Automatic flush water, $35. Total price, $5.95. <laughs> we better preach, haven't we? <laughs> Amen. Philippians 4 and 13. No, that's not on tape. <laughs> Man operating the tape machine just had it off right then. Okay, Philippians 4.13, let's read tonight. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. <laughs> Praise God. Would you say that with me? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I want to preach tonight on the attitude of a winner. The attitude of a winner. Brother Elm, come up here and pray for us. Amen. Pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight because we know we're going to hear from your divine mouthpiece. We thank you, Lord, that you have given the man of God the message of the hour. Inspire our hearts, our spirits, our minds, our total beings, 
to be set aflame with the message of the hour tonight. Use the man of God in a mighty way for your glory, for the kingdom's sake, that inspiration might come from above. In Jesus' name, amen. And everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated and God bless you. I must say what a joy it was this past Thanksgiving to have Brother Cornwell and Brother Royce Elms in our church preaching and what a masterful job they both did. I had been suffering for several weeks with some chest pain, had taken some uh, tread uh, tests and so on. Doctor said that there were some irregularities with my heart. And uh, on Thanksgiving night, Brother Ross Helms prayed. You remember Brother Cornwell? He prayed. He was praying for some people, and he prayed for me. And I have not had a pain since then. God is great, isn't he? Praise God. How many know your God is great tonight? Hallelujah, hallelujah. The attitude of a winner. You know, the word win means to be victorious, to succeed, to be triumphant. And the outcome of any contest is for the purpose of declaring a winner, to prove who will be a winner. There's something unique, there's something great, about being a winner, and there's something that separates winners from losers. Sometimes it's just a very narrow margin, it's a thin edge. But there is something that separates a winner from a loser. It's not always ability. The fact that one is a winner and another is a loser is not always determined by pure ability alone. I believe that even in this life, those who are in the category of a winner are those who possess an attitude and a spirit and a concept that is different from the mold of the thinking of the average and the ordinary. Praise God. Even in the sports world, those who have become winners are not always the most gifted athletes. It is a proven fact that many of those who have become the greatest winners in their athletic field have been some people who have possessed actually less natural ability than others. But there was something that separated them from the crowd. There was an attitude. There was something within them, an intangible something, something that you cannot necessarily see. You may not be able to put your finger on it, so to speak. But it's there. There is that attitude that would separate the winner from the loser. When I was just a boy, I was playing on the high school basketball team. That was before I got the Holy Ghost. When I got the Holy Ghost, I quit. We had one game to go, and it was for the championship, and I quit. Turned in the uniform. And they called me a loser and a coward, And the principal of the high school, when they lost the game in the state championships, uh, got up before the entire student body, called my name and called me a chicken and said, had I not chickened out, we might have won. But I didn't chicken out. I, I found something better. Praise God. But I played on the team with some fellas that had a great deal of ability that never did do much. And I played on teams with fellows who didn't have a great deal of ability, but they had a lot going for them that you couldn't see. They had a lot of desire. They had a lot of ambition. They had a lot of dedication. They had a lot of commitment. They had some things that was going for them that the average person could not see, but there is that which separates 
the men from the boys, the winners from the losers, and it is that which is in the heart of a person that says, I know what I want, and I'm going to go after it until I get it. Praise God. There are people in our world tonight who know what they want, and they're going to go after it. And that's what makes them the outstanding football player that they are, are the outstanding home run hitter they are, are the outstanding pitcher they are, are the outstanding basketball player that they are, are the outstanding businessman that they are, are maybe the outstanding politician that they are. There is that certain attitude that places them above the ordinary. And I believe that type of attitude needs to be infused into the hearts of the ministry, and not only the ministry, but in the heart of every child of God tonight. There needs to be that winner's concept, that winner's edge that says, regardless of the odds that may be stacked against me, I can and I will win for the cause and the glory and the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Ronald Reagan run for president in 1976. He was getting on up in years at that time, maybe about 66 or so, and uh, they said when he lost in the primaries to Mr. Ford that his opportunity for outstanding public offices was pretty well closed. But there was something in that man, and when he was running in 76, he came to our city, and my father, who's been here the last couple of nights, not here tonight, he was an avid follower of Mr. Reagan, and he was in our town at that time visiting, and he said, let's go down and see him. I said, all right. So we went down to the Ramadi Inn where Mr. Reagan was, and uh, got to shake his hand, whatever that's worth, depending on whether you're a Democrat or Republican or whatever. And uh, with the Reaganomics not being too hot right now, that's not worth maybe as much as it was a year ago. But uh, we got to shake his hand. He was a very congenial type of fellow, very relaxed man. He had a very positive attitude. And, uh, of course, we know that four years later, he comes back and wins in the highest office of this land. Well, there's something inside of a man that says, I refuse to give up. I refuse to be discouraged. I refuse to be down and out. I refuse to be defeated. When everybody else counts me out and writes me off, there's something within me that says I'm going to win. Hallelujah. And I believe that somehow we've got that intangible something in the heart of every missionary that's in this seminar tonight. You can feel it. You can sense it. There's a spirit in the air that says when I walk out of these doors tomorrow night and go back home to my city, I will be a winner for Jesus Christ in my city. Hallelujah. 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 They teach you in sales. They taught me in selling a little, a little saying that says, Good, better, best. Let's never rest until our good is better and our better is best. There's always room for improvement. Someone said the biggest room in the world is the room for improvement, and I think there's a great deal of truth in that. But there's got to be, there's got to be, it is not an alternative. There can be no alternative. There's got to be in the heart of a preacher a desire to succeed for God. Not for ourselves, but for God. Not to build ourselves a church, but to help build His church. For Jesus Christ said over 19 centuries ago, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates 
gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And that's the church that we're a part of tonight. Thank God for the privilege and the wonderful opportunity to be a part of God's glorious church. And I think it's the greatest privilege in the whole world. Hallelujah. I'd rather be a preacher of God's gospel than to be the president of the United States of America. Oh, hallelujah. I'd rather be preaching by the D-Heart the message of salvation that delivers men and women from sin and places them in the kingdom of God than to be the governor of the state of Louisiana. Oh, hallelujah. It's an honor to be a preacher. It's a high calling of God. Oh, hallelujah. Because we're involved in the souls of men. It's life or death. It's heaven or hell. Hallelujah. And we are placed in a strategic position of helping to deliver souls from the powers of hell. Oh, God, help us. Hallelujah. The winner has a positive attitude. The loser's attitude is negative. The winner says, I can. And the loser says, I hope, or maybe, or somehow it may work. The winners make things happen, and the loser is always sitting, waiting for it to happen. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. The winner says, if I'm going to have a church in this city, I've got to get out here and teach some Bible studies and knock on some doors and preach the word and fast and pray and do something to reach my city. One man told me not too long ago in our district, he said, well, I've got the building there and I've got a sign out front and we have our services on Wednesday night, Sunday and Sunday night. And he said, if they want to come, they can come. And if they don't, they can just go to hell. Now, friend, that's not the approach of the true God called preacher. They're not, gonna, they're not going to come flocking into our churches. There's not one command in the whole Bible for a sinner to come to your church. Hallelujah. But he said, go, 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 go. That's the command of God to the church. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Praise God. Praise God. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. And lo, I am with you all way, even to the end of the world. Aren't you glad you know the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost tonight? Oh, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. When I was, uh, had been in Durham two or three years, there was a preacher that came uh, to me. He'd been listening to our radio program, and he came to me. He was a preacher of another persuasion. And he, he came and he said, I want to talk to you in your office. And I said, okay. And he said, uh, uh, you or I one is wrong. And, of course, it didn't take a real smart man to figure that out because I was preaching Jesus' name, baptism, and he was baptizing them in titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And so he said, one of us is wrong. And he said, i tell you what I want to do. If you can prove to me that you're right, I'll let you baptize me. And if I can prove to you that I'm right, will you let me baptize you? I said, that's a deal, brother. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> he said, he said, you go first. I said, all right, let's turn to Matthew 28, 19. And he liked to drop his false teeth. <laughs> Praise God. He said, that's my verse. I said, no, that's not yours. That's my verse. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah, baptizing them in the name, in the name, in the name, in the name, in the name of the Father 
and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Matthew 1 21 said, Ye shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. John 5 43, he said, I'm coming in my Father's name. Hebrews 1 and 4 said, He got his name by inheritance. John 17 17, Jesus said, Father, I have declared thy name. Oh, hallelujah. The name of the Father is Jesus. The name of the Son is Jesus. And the Holy Ghost will come in my name, he said. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God tonight. There is a name that's above every name. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're not ashamed of it tonight. We're the people of the name. Oh, praise God. I said we're not ashamed of it. We're preaching a name. God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Can you say praise the Lord? Glory. When I read what the name of the Father Son, the Holy Ghost was, he jumped right straight up in the chair, and he said, I see it. Baptize me. I said, no, no. You sit back down. I said, I'm not through. Praise God. <laughs> I took him to Acts 2 and 38, Acts 8 and 16, Acts uh, 10, 48, Acts 19 and 5, Acts 22, 16. Praise God. He was about to shout. He said, let me out of here. He said, I got to go preach it. He said, I, I don't know what to do. He said, I got church Wednesday night in my church. What should I do? I said, I'll tell you what you do. I'm going to give you your sermon. I wrote him down some scriptures. I said, you study this and you preach this in your church Wednesday night. And he did, and they did what I thought they'd do. They threw him out. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. And when they threw him out, we took him in. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. And then the next night he came and I baptized he and his wife and three families that walked out with him. We helped them start a church. Last Sunday they had 76 in Sunday school. Let me tell you something, friend. God is getting the church ready. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Thank God tonight. Thank God tonight. We got a message that works. We've got a name that's got power in it. We got a God that's got victory in his name. Oh, hallelujah. This is not a defeated church. It's not a down and out church. It's not a despondent church. This is a victorious church. It's a Holy Ghost anointed church. It's a powerful church. It's a dynamic church. It's a Jesus name church. Hallelujah. And it's a thrill to be a part of it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, we're not going to leave here down in the mouth saying I maybe can do it. Every one of us are going to walk out of here and say God called me and God charged me and God sent me and I'm going. Hallelujah. And I'm going to win. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. Hallelujah. We're not going to wait for it to happen. We're going to help it to happen. We're labors together with God. But God's not going to do it all. Brother, we've got to get up and do something ourselves. Hallelujah. We've got to initiate the action. We must be progressive. Winners work hard. And that's one thing that separates them from losers. Winners are ambitious. 
Losers are lazy. Winners get up at 7 o'clock. Losers sleep till 10. I sneaked that in on you, didn't I? You can't build a church sleeping the noon every day, preacher. You got to get up, get out, and get with it. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Well, praise God. We need to get rid of our little thinking. We need to get rid of our small concepts. We need to get rid of the idea that if I go out there and get five or ten and hang on till Jesus comes, that's going to be all right. We need to crucify our negative thinking and believe that the God who sent us is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all we could ask or think. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. I don't know who told it, but somebody told about no boys fishing. Out on the bank, the young, he was, he was fishing and having pretty good luck, too. And he, every time he'd catch one, he'd measure him. And his buddy was down there a little ways. He didn't know him, but he was kind of watching him. He said, he noticed he was measuring them, and if they was very big, he'd throw them back in. I've always been right the other way around. If I ever caught one very big, man, I was proud of that thing. I just kept him. But he was throwing the big ones back in. And so, finally, old boy down the stream had about all he could take of him. He come down there and he said, I've been watching you fishing. He said, yes, sir. He said, I notice when you catch them, you measure them. He said, yeah. He said, you throw the big ones back in. Yes, sir. You keep the small ones. He said, sure do. He said, do you mind telling me why? He said, oh, it's very simple. He said, I just got an 18-inch skillet. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's our problem, Brother Yance. We just got an 18 skillet. We need to get a bigger skillet, bless your heart. We need to get a bigger skillet and we can catch some bigger sticks. Hallelujah. 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 We need to believe God for the impossible, the supernatural. Oh, hallelujah. And God will honor his word with signs following. Amen. Glory. Winners work hard. Success doesn't come easy. In fact, the only place that I know of that success comes before work is in the dictionary. Everywhere else, brother, work comes before success. <laughs> Hallelujah. We got a lot of preachers that's wanting to be successful, but they're not willing to work. Hallelujah. And we got a lot of preaching saints. We got some saints here too. We got a lot of saints that want to be successful, but they don't want to work for God. Hallelujah. I believe it starts in the heart of the preacher. It starts in the man of God. It gets embedded and burning in his soul. And it's transmitted to the congregation. And if the preacher's on fire, the church will be on fire. And if the preacher's a soul winner, the church will be soul winners. And if the preacher teaches Bible studies, the saints will teach Bible studies. But it's got to begin. In the heart of the preacher, the winner's concept has got to start right here in this pulpit. Got to begin right here. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, God, help us to understand I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. John 15, 6, he said, without me, you can do nothing, but with me, you can do all things. Without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. Hallelujah. I got to look at that word the other day and I broke it down. And that's what it is. It's just two little simple words. I, without me, you can do nothing or no thing. 
You can't do a thing without me. But Paul said, I can do all things through Christ. Without me, you can do no thing or nothing. But I can do all things through Christ. Success comes in cans. Hallelujah. I can do all things. I can do all things. I can do all things. I can have a church. I can preach because God called me. I may not can preach like Brother Jack D. Hodge, but I can preach because God called me. Hallelujah. I may not can preach like Brother Mary Cornwell, but I can preach because God called me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can build a church. I can see an altar full of people. I can baptize them in Jesus' name. I can see them get the Holy Ghost and talk in tongues. I can see them disciple in the saints of the Most High God. I can, I can, I can, I can. I can, I can. Somebody said that in 14 and 92 when Columbus came, before he came to discover what we know as the discovery of America, that they had coins at that time that said no more beyond It was said, I don't know if it's true, but it was said that Columbus got those coins and everyone he could get a hold of, he'd mark through and do his best to mark out the word no. Because they believed that the world was flat and they believed that if you'd go out so far, you'd just drop off somewhere and that'd be the end of it. And so they said... No more beyond. And Columbus had the guts to rub out the word no. Praise God, more beyond. More beyond. All of the negative thinkers in Pentecost are saying no more beyond. But we're bringing on a new breed of revival preachers and saints that's rubbing out the word no. Oh, hallelujah. I said, we've got a new breed of preachers that's not willing for the status quo to sit here year after year, number on the board, 50. It's been that way 25 years. We've got some preachers that are rubbing out the word no and saying there's more beyond. we got to get up and get with it, but our people are hungry for God. Oh, hallelujah. There's more beyond. Our churches can't have a revival. It's God's will. It's God's will. Well, 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 hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I can do all things through Christ. My neighboring pastor, Brother Huntley, my close friend, preached for me last night. He tells a little story, and you probably heard it about the fleas. And uh, said the man was training fleas, and he put them in a jar, and he put a lid on them. And they got to jumping up, and they'd hit their head against that lid. And when they did, they'd fall back down. Finally, they got programmed to just jumping so high, they'd jump almost to the top and fall back down. Jump up and fall back down. Jump up and fall back down. And finally, the man took the lid off. You know what they did? They jumped up just like they'd always been doing and fell back down. Came up so far, back down they went. They were programmed for a certain thing, Brother Yonts, and that's all they could do because that's all they were programmed for. I fear that sometimes in Pentecost we have been programmed over the years for things that we didn't need, and we've been programmed in concepts that we didn't need, and we've been programmed in ideas that we didn't need. And God forbid, I'm not being critical of the old preachers and the past 10,000 times, no, but I'm saying, friend, that God's got a work that must be done and it must be done hurriedly and it must be done quickly and it cannot get done by sitting down and folding our hands with a little sleep and a little slumber and a little folding the hands to sleep. Brother, it's time that we take the lid off and realize we can jump out of the 20s and we can jump out of the 30s and we can jump out of the 40s and we can have 50 and 75 and 100 and 150 and 200 and 300 and 400 and 500. We've got to get the lid off and jump on out. 
Amen. I read today in Luke 11, a very familiar scripture, and it tells here about a man that went to a friend at midnight. And he said, friend, give me three loaves. I believe it's midnight. I believe the midnight hour is just about upon us. It's approaching. God help us. We've got to be about our Father's business. We've got a short time to do a great job. We've got a short while to do a gigantic task. This man came and he said, friend, at midnight, I need three loaves. I've got some folks that are hungry and they're tired and they're weary and they've been journeying and I need the three loaves at midnight. Praise God. It's just about midnight right now. And I got to look at that and I, I might be taking it out of context, but that's all right for right now. I believe we've got three loaves. And I've got, I turned over to Acts 2 and 38. We got three loaves to give them. First loaf is repentance. Second loaf is water baptism in Jesus' name. And then the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Brother, there's a lot of people that's tired and weak and weary and it's almost midnight and we've got what they need. But if we say I'm tired and weary, I've already retired for the night. I can't come down. I'm asleep and my family's asleep. Brother, we'll not ever meet the need of this hour. But oh God, oh God, give us preachers that'll come down from the upper room and say I've got what what you need. Hallelujah. If you worry, rest with us. You that are worry, rest with us. If you're tired, rest with us. The master said, come unto me, all you that labor, labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and holy in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. Brother, if people are tired, we've got the rest. If they're weary, we know where the answer is. If they're hungry, we've got food. If they're thirsty, there's living water. There's everything that you need tonight. It's midnight, and the church has got the three loaves. If we're willing to be disturbed and feed our hungry world. I'm going to tell you something. When you get a growing church, they'll keep you busy. Sometimes baptizing folks at midnight. Sometimes counseling with folks at 2 o'clock in the morning. Hallelujah. They'll disturb you from some things that you want to do. Places maybe you want to go. But you know, new converts are, are beautiful people. Oh, I love new converts. Had an old boy I taught a home Bible study to. And he's, uh, he's a graduate of Southwestern University in Memphis. He was the valedictorian of his class in high school. Went to Southwestern and... Uh, was a straight A student in college, major in math. Daddy's a doctor in Tennessee. And he's just looking, just searching for something. Tried just about everything. Went to France and studied a year. Came back to Princeton University, worked on a master's degree. Got hooked up with uh, Martin Luther King a while, marched with him. Then went to New York in recent years and got with Sun Moon and, and has knelt at his feet and, and uh, had him to talk to him. And he just tried and searched and finally moved to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where the University of North Carolina is, five miles from us. In fact, it's all, all part of one town, Durham and Chapel Hill. And he moved there and uh, through the hand of God, he visited our church by seeing an ad in the paper. Praise God. And he came and as a result, he was baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. I taught him a Bible study and his wife was not receptive. She was a, a Quaker and she didn't want to hear it. But I went every Monday night and taught him a Bible study. Praise God. And, and after I got through teaching the whole Bible study for over a year, she still went to the Quaker church. But after over a year, she came and I baptized her and she got the Holy Ghost. And they're both in church now. In fact, he's the head of our, our ACE school now. Praise God. Let me tell you something, friend. They'll keep Keep you busy, but what I'm saying is this: He went out and taught an old boy named Donnie recently a Bible study, and Donnie got baptized. He came into church, had hair down to his waist almost, and had a beard and and had a red handkerchief tied around his head. Man, he was a sight when he came in. 
Praise God. He was a sight, but he came to the altar, and we baptized Donnie, and he got the Holy Ghost, and he came to me a week later, and he said, I believe you know my dad. I said, who is your dad? He said, he's a car dealer down here. And he, I said, oh, yes, he sold us a, a new Maxi Wagon van. I got to talking to him. Donnie's baptized, got the Holy Ghost. Now then, he's teaching a home Bible study. The boy he's teaching has been baptized and got the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And Sunday night, Sunday night, Donnie's mama came for the very first time. She said, I love it. I've been Methodist all my life, but I love this. I'm coming back. My husband is coming next Sunday. He said, we are so proud for what this church has done for Donnie. He's off of alcohol. He's off of drugs. Let me tell you, friend, it works. It works. Glory. Hallelujah. It's a chain reaction. It's from one to the other, to the other, to the other. Praise God. Praise God. What about that little woman with an issue of blood in Mark 5? She came to Jesus and she started pressing her way through the crowd. She wanted to get where he was. She'd had an issue of blood for 12 years. Spent everything she had. Was nothing better but rather grew worse. And the Bible said when she heard of Jesus, hallelujah, she came in a press and touched his garments, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. I'm talking about the spirit of a winner now. I'm talking about a woman that could have easily gotten defeated and discouraged and said the crowd's too great and there's too much problems to get in there and, and it'd be such a chore to get in and touch him. I wanted to, but I guess I'm defeated. I might as well go home, maybe try again. That's not the spirit of a winner, brother. The attitude of a winner is I'm going to go in whatever it takes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Excuse me, sir. Move over, ma'am. Where's that lady going? I don't know. Hallelujah. But I'll tell you where she's going to wind up. Right at the feet of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. There's something in her that says, I believe if I could get there, I spent everything. I'm broke. I don't have a thing. I don't have any money. I've got a sickness in my body. I need some help. I believe this man put on the cross as we fling ourselves upon him and say, God, here I am. Here's my life. Praise God. Praise God. The fountain of her blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed from that plague. Jesus turned around and said, Who touched my clothes? The disciples were not keenly sensitive at that moment, for they said, There's a big crowd here, and there's a lot of people thronging you. And why do you say, Who touched me? But friend, there's a difference in just thronging Jesus and touching him. Hallelujah. A lot of our religious world is thronging him, Brother Cornwell. But thank God there's some that's got the spirit of a winner that says, I'm going to touch him. I'm not here to be critical. Never have I desired to do that or to offend anyone. But I can just tell you what I feel tonight. and Maybe it'll be all right with you. But I believe that a lot of the religious world is just kind of thronging around Jesus. And they're saying, come and join the church, sign the card, shake the preacher's hand, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, make a profession of faith. I went by a church the other day, and in uh, fact, Brother Hawkins, it was in Dunn, North Carolina. It was some time ago, several months ago, and it had a big sign out on the front, and it said, Great Day Sunday. It said, uh, 19 saved, no, 22 saved, and 3 baptized. Great day Sunday. Had it on the marquee, Brother Young. Twenty-two saved and three baptized. And I thought, dear Lord, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He didn't say, He that believeth and is saved shall be baptized. That's what the world says. But Jesus Christ said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The world's thronging him. They're thronging him. And I believe that even the charismatic world is thronging him. Maybe there are many honest, sincere hearts in that category. But I believe they're just thronging him. Why should we sit by idly on the seat of do nothing and let the charismatics take over? My God, help us tonight. We've got the total message. We've got the full gospel message of salvation. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 
You say the charismatics are taking over. I believe we ought to do more than they're doing. Work harder than they're working. Put more into it than they are. Reach more people. Do whatever it takes. Hallelujah. We've got the message, brethren. And we need to get it out. Hallelujah. We need to touch him. We need to touch him. Praise God. Praise God. She got what she wanted because she pressed through. How was it that David was able to slay the giant? He had the spirit of a winner. He made his way where the giant was. Getting five smooth stones, he flung one of them and it hit its mark. Esther says, if I perish, I'll perish. I'm going in before the king and see if he'll hold out that golden scepter. Ruth said, whether thou goest, I will go. And whether thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy people shall be my people. And thy God shall be my God. We need that kind of spirit infiltrating the hearts of God's people tonight. We need the spirit of a Job. That when he lost everything he had. And his wife said, why don't you curse God and die? He said, just speak as a foolish woman. For naked came I into this world. And naked shall I go thither. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Though God slay me, yet will I trust him. And though the skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Oh, God, give us the spirit of a winner that says I'm going to succeed. It's God's plan. It's his will. It's his purpose. And I shall. Let's lift our hands and praise him right now. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, praise God. I pray the Holy Spirit of God will wash out all of our negativism tonight as our musicians come. I pray the Holy Spirit will wash away our doubts and our fears and our frustrations and our inhibitions and our apparent inabilities and trust in God and say, God, if you sent me, hallelujah, I may not have as pretty church as the big church of town, but there's one thing I've got. I've got the gospel of peace that can set a man free from his sins. I know it works. Hallelujah. It's been working for over 19 centuries and it'll still work in your city. Wherever you are, it'll still work in 82. Did you know that there are people that are leaving big, nice, and there's nothing wrong with big, nice churches. Here's the point I'm making. There are people who are leaving big, nice, fancy churches with robed choirs and educated preachers. They're leaving all the finery, the pomp, and the regalia of something beautiful because there's no life there. And they're hungry. And they're reaching out for something. And they'll come. You say, well, I just got a little old storefront. But they'll come to that storefront. They'll feel God. Say, I'm just having church right now in the basement of my home, but they'll come to the basement of your home. Don't apologize for that. Hallelujah. You say, Brother Good, I just got a little old small building. Nobody wants to come to that. I've seen people in my 20 years of pastoring that have left, left beautiful large churches to come into our little old storefront buildings. Hallelujah. I've seen it time and time again because when they walked in that place, they could feel the glory and the presence and the power. Oh, let me tell you something, preacher. You may not have beautiful carpet like this. It takes time to get this and thank God for this church. You may not have beautiful gold carpet like this, but you can have the power of God. Oh, you may not have a lovely choir like this, but there's not a thing to keep you from having the power of God. You may not have music and musicians like this, but there's not a thing to keep you from having the power of God. Oh, hallelujah. With a half a dozen people there, you can plug into the power of the Holy Ghost. And when your visitors come, they're going to feel the glory of the Lord. And that's going to mean more than anything else in the whole world. 
Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. You may not have a lot of things, but you've got the power of God. Hallelujah. Don't don't accentuate the negative. Accentuate the positive. Don't tell those ministers what you don't have. Tell them what you have. And that's the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost. And it'll set them free from their sins. It'll patch up their lives and mend up their broken hearts and fix up their marriages that are on the rocks. You've got what they need. You've got what they need. Hallelujah. Someone said, if you think you're beaten, you are. If you think you're there not, you don't. And if you like to win, but you think you can't, it's almost a sense that you won't. If you think that you'll lose, you've lost. We're out in the world, you'll find that success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in the state of mind. We need to believe that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can teach Bible studies. I can knock doors. I can pass out tracts. I can win souls. I can reach my city. I can preach to five or fifty. It doesn't matter. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I feel His love here right now. I feel His love here right now. Let's just lift our hands and worship Him. Oh, oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Say it in your heart tonight, preacher, while your hands are lifted and your eyes are closed. Say it with me. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Let's say it aloud together. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can do all all things through Christ which strengthens me. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 You say, but my sin is different. I close with this. You say, it's hard, it's difficult, it's a burn over field. Nobody wants God. I read about in Philippi, they beat the disciples, but Paul went on in the how the church was built. Corinth was a city known as a cesspool of immorality, but Paul went there and a church was raised up. Ephesus was a city that was given to idolatry. Hallelujah, but a church for the name of the Lord was established there. At Rome, my friend, Christians were thrown to hunger lions. Praise God, but there were converts one to God right out of sea. His household. I'm telling you, you can build a church anywhere. Anywhere. I don't believe there's some towns that you can't build a church in. If it's 1,000, or 10,000, or 50,000, or a million or two, I believe that if God sent you there, you can build a church. You can be successful for the name of the Lord. But you've got to have the winner's edge, the winner's concept. The winner's attitude. I can. I can. I can. Thessalonica preachers were publicly assaulted. But a church was established there. It don't matter where you are. If God sent you, you're a winner. You can't lose. 
<laughs> he said, but I'm not but ten little old folks there, but you're still a winner. You're already a winner. In God's eyes, you're already a winner. I can got the 24 in Sunday school. Hallelujah. But you're already a winner. We don't have to get together and compare numbers and so on. Oh, my friend, if you're there and you're seeking the teeth into it and you're doing the will of God and you're after a time, you're a winner for God. You're a winner for God. Hallelujah. I heard about old John L. Sullivan. The old, old boxer from years ago, and some of you men probably read about him. He, John L. Sullivan boxed back in the days when they fought bare-fisted. I mean, they went at it, brother. It was knuckle city. He fought in Chicago, shows up a hill of 100,000 people on an August night, over 100 degrees in that sweltering arena that night. 102 rounds. The night he won the world championship, bare-fisted. What an accomplishment. Nobody could whip John L. Sullivan. But I read a little incident about John L. that was interesting. He went to France for an exhibition match throughout Europe. He wound up in France. Brother Lucas, and when he got there, there was a little Frenchman there, a little short fella. They said he was the fastest thing anybody had ever seen. And he was the most unique boxer there had ever been because he didn't box with his fist. He hit with his bare feet. And he wanted to fight John L. And John L. said, I'll take him on, no problem. And John L. got in the ring with him. And the little Frenchman was coming up with his feet, mind you, and hitting John L. so fast he couldn't even retaliate. And John L. was getting weak and worried and about to go down. The world's champ was about to be whipped by a five-foot-five Frenchman that was boxing with his bare feet. Hallelujah. But finally... John L. was down over there on the side, near the edge of the ring. He was perspiring, he was tired and worried. He hadn't even hit the place with a good lick yet. But his, his report was later, he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come up and I'm going to put everything I got in one lick. And if I hit him, I'll, I'll take care of him. But if I don't, I'm sunk. And so the little old Frenchman was standing there smiling, grinning, gloating over his victory over the great John L. Sullivan. And John L. was there giving up his last bit of strength. And when he came up and he swung, he hit the little old Frenchman right upside the head and knocked him about 20 feet out of the ring and he landed over the grand piano. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, I put everything I had into that one swing because I knew if I didn't get him then, I was a goner. Let me tell you something, friend. There may be some preacher here tonight that feels like you're down on your knees in the corner and you're just about out. But brother, why don't you get one more swing and say, devil, I'm going to hit you and hurt you. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to be a winner. I'm going to be a winner. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and praise God. Whoa! Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Whoa! Hallelujah! 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 Well, oh, praise God! How many winners we got here tonight? How many winners we got here tonight? Hallelujah! Wave your hand if you're a winner. Preach for our saints. Oh, hallelujah. If you're a winner, let's clap our hands. I want winners to clap your hands. Glory. 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 I'm not a loser. I'm a winner. I'm not defeated. I'm victorious. I'm not down and out. I've got God. I'm a winner. I'm a winner. I'm a winner. Fight one more round. Someone wrote, when your feet are so tired that you have to shuffle back to the center of the ring, fight one more round. When your arms are so tired that you can hardly lift your hands to come on guard, 
Fight one more round. When your nose is bleeding and your eyes is black, and you're so tired that you wish your opponent would just go ahead and hit you on the jaw and put you to sleep. Fight one more round. Remembering that he who will fight one more round will never be a loser. Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, why don't we praise the Lord? <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. I've got something I just kind of feel just in the last moment or so here that I'd like for the preachers to do if they would in a moment. But I feel like saying this. I really don't know why I hadn't intended to say it, but I feel like saying it. Maybe, maybe it'll help someone if you'll pardon the personal reference. When we went to the city of Durham, North Carolina, nine years ago, we started looking for a building. I was looking for, a, first of all, for a house to rent. The Lord opened up a house and we bought it, and uh, just, just the hand of God. And then we began to look for a building. We was two months trying to find a building. We weren't out of church that long. We was in church several times a week with neighboring churches being in church and preaching and whatever but we were two months trying to find a building and uh, finally I, I, I we was praying my wife and we were praying and I felt inspired to put an ad in the paper and I put an ad in the paper that uh, under real estate I put an ad that real estate wanted a building to either rent lease or buy for church purposes and um, there was a church called us Church Christ and uh, they were thinking about building. The building was not up for sale. And I come to find out later that there was one man on that board. His name was Dr. Jones. He's a doctor at Duke University Hospital, still is. He wanted to sell to us, and all the other six men, plus the pastor on that board, didn't want to sell, and they wound up selling to us. And they hadn't even bought property yet. Bless your heart, Brother Gidrose, without even buying property, I know it was God, it had to be. They sold us their building, and they didn't even have a building started or property. And they had to go rent a building themselves for three years and pay $350, $400 a month. And one of their members told me later, said, we're the craziest bunch of folks I've ever seen in my life. We had a good building, had it paid for, and we sold it and rented the building. He said, I don't know why in the world we did that. And I said, I know why. He said, why? I said, it was God. He said, hush your mouth. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. But we, we, we could get that building, and, and uh, finally we looked for a building, looked, looked, and it hadn't dawned on me yet that we didn't have any money to buy one with. We were just looking for one. <laughs> and we didn't have a bit of money. We didn't, I'm telling you, we just didn't have it. And uh, so I, I began to try to go to the banks and so on to, to borrow money. After we found out we could get the building, they said we need $6,000 down. The building was $30,000. That was 1973. Pay 6000 down, 80% loan, finance the rest of it. But you've got to have $6,000. So Christmas for Christ and cheese for Christ was so nice and helped us to get the 6000 But everywhere I'd go, I'd uh, talk to them. They'd say, uh, where's your church at? And I told them where it's going to be. How many members you have? None. No members? You mean you got a church and no members? Huh? I'm sorry, preacher, we couldn't, we couldn't loan money like that. And so finally, Mr. Burwell Allen, who uh, was a real estate man that sold us our house, I talked to him, and he said, I'll tell you what, i got a good friend, Security Federal Savings Loan, I'll call him, and I'll make an appointment, you can talk to him, and maybe he'll loan you. And so he, he got on the phone and called him, he talked to him briefly, and said, i got a preacher here, he came from Missouri, he's wanting to buy a church, and he needs some money, and, and he said, how many members he got? He said, none. He said, don't even send him over. Don't even let him come over. He said, I will not talk to him. And so I tried, honestly, I tried every bank, every savings loan. I tried everything. I'd exhausted every means. And I just about, just about to the point of not knowing what to do. One Friday afternoon at 3.30, I was standing on a corner downtown. And I, I was just a little bit low in spirit. I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't know, Brother Young, just how it was going to happen because we tried everything. 
And I looked up and I was standing right in front of Security Federal Savings and Loan. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, go in there and they'll loan you the money. And I looked at the name of that place and I argued with God on the street corner. I said, but God, that's the building where the man who's the president of that told Mr. Allen that he didn't even want to talk to me. And the Lord spoke to me again on the street corner and said, go in that building and ask to see the president. Of the savings and loan. I stood there about five, ten minutes. It's going on four, and it's going to close at four o'clock. And I finally walked in, and I just got got some bolts. I just straightened my shoulders up. Praise God! Got the spirit of a winner. I walked in. Reception sitting there, big building, several stories high. She said, "May I help you?" And I said, "You can." She said, "What do you want?" I said, "I want to see the president of this place." She said, "Who?" I said, "The president." of the saving loan. She said, uh, you have an appointment? I said, no, ma'am. She said, oh, she laughed. She said, there's no way you can see the president of this place without an appointment. He's, I, I'm sure you understand, sir. He's a busy man. I said, I know that, but I want to see the president of this savings loan. And I got to see him this afternoon. She said, I'm sorry. There's no way, sir, as though to just close the door. And I said, and I didn't know I was going to say it, but the Holy Ghost moved on me. And I said, ma'am, I want to see the president. I said, I was standing on that street corner out there, and the Lord told me to come in here, and I could see the president. She said, who told you? I said, the Lord. She said, he did. And I said, he did. She said, wait just a minute. And she went. <laughs> Praise God. And she went, she went somewhere, and she came back, and she said, uh, He'll see you. Just be seated. I said, all right. And so I said, Am about five minutes. She called me and said, Mr. Brock, I'll see you now. I went to Mr. Larry Brock's office, walked in, and he met me, and I shook his hand. He's a nice, congenial fellow. He said, aren't you the preacher Burwell Allen called me about? I said, I am. He said, I told him, sir, that there's no way. He said, you don't even have any members? I said, no. He said, you don't have, I don't have anything. He said, well, I couldn't loan you the money. And I said, but Mr. Brock, the Lord told me standing on that street corner that you'd loan me the money. He said, who told you? I said, God told me. He said, sit down. Let's talk about it then. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you something. It's time for us to, it's time for us to realize that God has called us and we can do everything that God wants us to do. He said, now I've got a board here I have to answer to. He said, every loan's approved with the board. He said, but fill out the application. I'll tell you. He said, honestly, friend, I don't believe it'll do a bit of good. But if you're that insistent, fill this out. I'll call you next Thursday and tell you what the board said. We're meeting Wednesday afternoon. I said, all right. Before I walked out, I shook his hand. And I said, I can already tell you what they're going to do. He said, I wouldn't be sure of that. He said, I don't see any way. I said, well, God already said it, and it's going to happen. Thursday morning about 9.30, he called me, and he said, preacher. And I said, yes, sir. He said, guess what? I said, I know what. I got the loan. He said, how'd you know? I said, because God already told me. He said, well, I don't know who told you, but you got the loan. Craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. He said, but you got the loan. <laughs> Amen. Oh, let me tell you something, friend. If God be for us, then who can be against us? And greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm a winner. Let's all fall together. I am a winner. Let's say it again. I am a winner. I've got the right attitude. I've got the right concept. I believe it. God told me I'm a winner. I'll tell you what I feel. I don't know how I usually do it. I haven't been to the seminar in three or four years, but I'll tell you how we're going to do this right now. I feel like asking every man here right now who needs a building, and I just felt this since we've been standing, and I believe it's God. I want every preacher and their wife that needs a building in your city to step out from where you are and stand in the aisle. This is not for show. This is not for anything else. Oh, ha. oh hallelujah. Hey, looky here, will you? 
Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Did you know God's got a building for you in your city? God's already got one targeted for you. It's as good as though your name was already up there. Hallelujah. It's as though the sign was already painted. God has got a building for you and your church because he sent you and you're his winner. Now, now this is what I'd like this to do. If you'll hold just a minute. This is what I feel like doing. As Joshua and his men marched around the walls of Jericho, six days, seventh day, seven times, the walls fell. I'm not going to ask you how many times to march, but I really feel without any fanfare, showmanship, that's not what it's for. I just felt it since we've been standing. I'd like to ask men and their wives to walk side by side and just walk around this congregation. And we're not going to just stand and be spectators like those people were in that day. While you're marching, we're going to pray with you. And we're going to believe God that God will give you a building. I'd like you to start right over here if you would and go this way and march around. And I'd like for the whole congregation up in the balcony everywhere, would you join me in prayer? These are some wonderful couples and they need a desperately need a place to have church. I'd like for this whole assembly to pray. Would you pray? Would you enter into a spirit of prayer and intercession that God will answer and provide a building speedily to advance His cause and kingdom in the cities that are represented by these men? Oh, let's pray, church. God's got the right building. It may not be big, it may not be fancy, I don't know what it looks like, but God has already got it targeted for you! Whoa! Brother Cornwell, Brother Young, Brother Elms, Brother Yance, Brother Dehart, would you brother come down? and lay hands on these couples as they come by. I believe God's going to perform some miracles. I believe the Holy Spirit is at work right now. God's a moving back in your town. God's got the right place. He's got the right comforter. He's got the right building. The Holy Spirit is working right now. Right now. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's believe. We are winning. He's got 
designs for you. Continue to pray with us, church. This is such a vital thing. It is so necessary. It is so meaningful. It is such an urgent need. And many of these missionaries must pray. Oh, God. Pray, oh, tear the walls down. Walls of doubt, fear, unbelief. They've got to fall tonight. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! He knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what you need. God's got his eyes on you. You're his child. You're his property. Hallelujah! You are the building of God, a habitation of God through the Spirit. God's got his eyes on you. Hallelujah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. telling you the Holy Spirit is working here right now. God's not only working here, but he's working back home in other states and up in Canada. The Holy Spirit's working. Depend on it, preacher. Count on it. God's working. The Holy Spirit's are gaining some things that's going to come to fruition in a short while. Believe it in your heart.
to the gates of hell, the gates of hell will not stand. It will crash through and destroy the gates of hell. That's what Jesus really said. He destined us to win. Thank you, Brother Godair. Praise God. If we can get our priorities right and know what we really want, and get our attitudes right and know how to think, and then our actions will determine what our attitude really is. It said of John Wesley when he left this earth, he left hardly anything. An old worn out frock, an old tea kettle, a silver teaspoon, and the Methodist Church. And the Methodist Church was preaching repentance and sanctification that was shaking the foundations of this earth. It's in you. Praise God. God ordained us to be winners. If Lewis Morley dragging one crippled leg over those mountains of Columbia can leave a church when he comes home from the mission field, you can win in your city. He drug that old crippled leg all over Columbia. He can hardly stand up tonight. Came home to retire and he can't quit. They're still doing the work of God. Praise God. That's so great for the Godair. Reminds me of just one more story. Jack Hyle said he was driving down the street one day and said there were two kids fighting. One of them was a great big old fella and the other was a little bitty fella. And he said that big fella was literally mopping up the sidewalk with that little boy. He'd knock him down and he'd get up again. And he said, it made me so mad, I stopped my car and I got out and I said, you big bully, you get off of that guy or you're going to whip me. He said, the little fellow was, said his face was all muddy and bloody and his blood all over his shirt. His clothes was tor torn and he looked up and he said, please, mister, he said, don't stop this fight. He said, I'm about to get my second win. <laughs> and he said, I figured... If he had that kind of fight in him, let him go. And he said, I stood there and watched him and said, that big guy knocked him down again and he got up and swung and they knocked him down again and he got up and swung and said, finally, after three or four times, that little guy got up and hit him right square on the chin and his lights went out. He said he jumped up on his chest and put his hands over his head and he swung them like that and he said, I gave him a dollar. You never whip till you admit it. Right. <laughs> Let's win. And when we say win, we're talking about building a church. That's right. It's more important than anything. That's right. And don't get sidetracked. Don't get sidetracked with making money. Don't get sidetracked 
with a lot of properties. Don't get sidetracked with anything. That priority is a church. And if you really need money, the best way in the world to get money is to win the loss. The, the coin is in the fish's mouth. And you know what? People are going to places and they'll, they'll do all kinds of projects. They'll write for all kinds of gimmicks. And they'll work themselves to death to pay rent bills and light bills and this kind of bill. And all if they spent that much time on souls, the souls would come in and take care of all of them. Praise God. Make that top priority build a church. If you've determined you're going to put your life in that city and you're going to stay there till you build a church and you put that kind of an attitude with home Bible studies and prayer and fasting, it won't be long. You're going to have a lot of people helping you. Oh, this is so great. i tell you what I want you to do before we dismiss. I want every minister to turn to his wife and take her hands and look her straight in the eye. That's right here with your wife. I want you to look her straight in the eye. And I want each of you to say to the other, Honey, don't ever forget to help me with my attitude. When my attitude is bad, please tell me and help me. I want to know. Do it. I remember one time my wife helped me so much, and I didn't appreciate it at the time. I was trying to find the will of God, and everywhere I looked, I couldn't find it. And I'd been searching for several months, and I, a lot of things had frustrated me, opportunities that I could have had, I couldn't take because I knew it wasn't the will of God. And finally I said to her, God doesn't need me anymore. And I thought she had sympathized with me. I thought she'd put her arm around my neck and say, well, honey, you, he really does. She said, I don't want you to ever talk like that again about my Lord. <laughs> don't let me ever hear you say that. So I thought, well, I didn't get any sympathy there. I'll go tell God that. And I went and told God that. But you know what? It got through to me. And she was right. <laughs> Once in a while we need that other person that's so close to us to tell us about our attitude. Because to keep it right, we'll be a winner. God bless you all. Jesus. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.